as the strength God supplies so that in all things God's name will be glorified through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Highly esteemed listeners, welcome to the Oracles of God radio broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come your way every Wednesday 5.30 a.m on Radio Universe 105.7 FM. Shall we commit ourselves to the Almighty God? We bless your name, O Lord. We adore you and magnify your holy name for your wonderful things you've done in our lives that passes all our understanding. We thank you for this brand new Wednesday you've added to our lives. We know it is just by your grace and abundance mercy that it be possible. Who are we that you so mindful of the Son of Man that you love so much? You've raised just a little lower than the angels and you've crowned us with the crown of life. We thank you for such wonderful blessings, protection and guidance you've accorded us. We beseech thee, O Lord, that you continue to forgive us our numerous sins we've committed against you in all forms so at the end we shall be saved when you come again. We once again I thank you for this opportunity you are calling us to listen to your priceless oracles. We pray that you continue to grant us utterance as well as hearts of understanding that we will be able to understand perfectly your word that will be able to build us up in this world and the world to come. Once again, we are grateful for the lives of the staff of Radio Universe, especially do we ask for your strength, wisdom, and grace that your words will be transmitted on and traded to your audience. Begin and end successful with us. In the name above all names, Jesus Christ, our Lord, do we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. The established listeners, we continue for a series of lessons we draw from the theme, Dead Preachers or prophets, especially the Old Testament prophets, the lessons that we need to learn from them, as well as the lessons we need to apply in our daily lives and understand even the mission of prophecy, especially as with all around us, a whole lot of people that claim to call themselves prophets, claiming to be the prophets as they were in the Old Testament. And that is why we've taken time to look at the issue of prophets itself as I described in the scriptures. So far we've learned and we've come to the conclusion that the prophets that God used in the Old Testament, most of them were farmers. And therefore the setting was just right for them for God to use as they were so close to nature and God's people had wandered away. We also looked at how God used them and we said the main function of the prophets, well, the main function was to preach the word of God. In fact, they spoke the word of God to God's children that had wandered away. The more the prophets the, the, the more the signal that 
God's children had moved away from his path. And so we learned that the main purpose of the prophet God will raise was to preach the word of God to his children so that they will not wander away further and be warned that if they did not they resist from what they were doing, they were going to be punished, they were sent to be they were going to be sent to cap into captivity, they were going to be killed. And so this was the main message. We said that the aspect of prophecy that we written in the scriptures is just a minute aspect of the totality of the work of the prophets. And this aspect has been written because it bore down to the coming of the Messiah. And so we should not make the mistake of thinking that when we talk about the Old Testament prophets, all that they were doing was to foretell what was going to happen. That was really there. It was just a level aspect. The main way, that's why we call them preachers. And so we said, let the dead preachers speak to us today so that we are not tossed to and fro by any way of doctrine. We also explain how we have major and minor prophets by virtue of the length of the books they wrote and also the duration of their period. And we picked the book of Jonah. And we've learned a lot from the book of Jonah, how God loves all mankind and how he sent Jonah to go to Nineveh, people that even were not under a strict covenant relationship and therefore how God is concerned for the whole world. We also learned last week about how it is important for us to identify, understand that God-given duties are inescapable. God-given duties are inescapable and therefore when Jonah tried to do so, God taught him a lesson. Jonah preaches to us today that God's presence is inescapable, God's duties are inescapable, God's concern is for the whole world and loves anybody who wants to come to him. And so we should also note that Jonah also was not unlike us because God knows the end from the beginning and therefore sent Jonah to Nineveh to go and prepare a town that will later come and take the Israelites into Assyria captivity. But if they have not prepared that place for them, it will be more disastrous. In the same way, we don't know why God takes certain action on us, certain decision on us, and to all things work together for good for those who love God. So it's all things we have been admonished to give thanks to the Almighty God. The same business. Today we want to look at Prophet Amos. We want to look at Amos and also see the lessons that we can draw from Amos. The meaning of the name Amos defines the ministry of every preacher. In fact, the meaning of Amos is burden bearer. Burden bearer. Thus, preachers have the burden to keep the word of God before the people, regardless of whether it is received or rejected. According to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5. The service listeners. Amos was a farm boy from Judah. He was a herdsman of sheep and goats in the small mountains village of Tekoa, south of Jerusalem. When we read Amos chapter 7 verse 14, we will come across this. Amos 7 14. Because of his farming culture, we can understand why God called him to preach judgment to the cities of the northern kingdom of Israel. Since the cities often lead the culture of a nation, the tax of preaching to the cities is the tax of saving the nation. For this reason, God used a farmer, preacher, in order to get the city people back on track with the word of God. As a herdsman, it is interesting to note how God called Amos. In Amos chapter 7 verse 15, Amos 7 15, it reads, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy or preach to my people Israel. Unquote. The same witness. Though we do not understand what took me implies, we can assume that the moral degradation of the city society of the northern kingdom of Israel was enough to move the farmer preacher into action. His could have been the same emotion that cut through the heart of Paul 
when Paul first stepped foot in Corinth. In Acts chapter 18, verse 5, Acts 8, 5, 18, 5, the reads, Paul was compelled in the spirit and testified, and on and on it goes, unquote. Amos was taken from his flocks around 760 BC and continued his ministry to 750 BC. He began preaching in Bethel of the Northern Kingdom, but because of the straightforward nature of his message and preaching, as is the case with most farmer preachers, this did not last long. He was driven from the cities of the Northern Kingdom back to his homeland of Judah. Those who rejected his message said to him, in Amos chapter 7, verse 12 and 13, Amos 7, 12 to 13, he reads, Go, you seer, flee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. But do not prophesy again any more at Bethel, for it is a sanctuary of the king and a royal residence. Unquote. The same is listeners. So off to the farm in Judah, Amos fled. We assume that it was in Judah where he wrote the words of the book that is part of the scriptures we now study. Now let's look at the historical or social background. The historical or social background. There were peace among nations at the time of Amos' ministry to the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah and Israel were at peace with one another. Under the reign of Jeroboam II, that is 786 to 746 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel had secured its borders to as far north as Damascus. Under the kingship of Tiglath Pileser III, the Assyrian kingdom was building up in the east. This would be the force of the east that would eventually be God's proxy to bring judgment upon Israel. By the time of Amos preaching, the northern kingdom under the 40-year reign of Jeroboam II was prospering. It was prospering to the point of establishing an economy that was close to what Israel experienced during the reigns of David and Solomon. Unfortunately, distinguished listeners, the prosperity of the society created a morally digressed social environment that necessitated God's call of Amos. Wealth had moved from the rural to the urban, and subsequently the cities of the north were overpopulated with the rich. The rich in the cities sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. Amos chapter 2 verse 6. Amos 2 6. They, the rich, pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and pervert the way of the meek. Amos chapter 2 verse 7. Amos 2 7. The sinlessness. Amos' irony that they pant after the dust on the head of the poor reveals the extreme to which the rich exploited the poor for their own prosperity. Their extreme greed manifested their social injustice. And so in Amos 2 7, Amos 2 7, morally is quoted, a man and his father will go into the same girl to profane my holy name, unquote. God's accusation against the society of the rich and oppressive and immoral was that they lie down by every altar on clothes taken in place and they bring the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Amos chapter 2 verse 8. Amos 2 8. Highly esteemlessness. The distorted economics of the society led to the corruption of the society. The control of the future of the nation rested in the hands of the rich. The rich were so powerful in controlling the economy of the nation that they economically exploited the poor. These digressed to the point that justice was twisted for the sake of the rich. Amos cried out, You rich who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. Unquote. Amos chapter 5 verse 7. Amos 5 7. The minority rich, therefore, will face their judgment. So in Amos chapter 5 verse 11, Amos 5 11, Amos proclaim the judgment. Therefore, because you trample on the poor, and you take from him tribute of grain, 
and have built mansions of hewn stone, you will not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you will not drink wine from them. Unquote. The statelessness. In some places, the early church came into such a socio-economic moral condition in the first century. James and Amos had audiences with similar dysfunctions. James condemned the rich seditions among the early Christians with the West. In James chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, James 2, 6 and 7, he reads, But you rich have despised the poor. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Unquote. When money becomes the standard by which a society determines the function of relationships, then all sort of corruption destroys the society. The level of corruption of any society determines the level of focus that a society places on money. And in the case of the society with which Amos was dealing, bribes became the standard upon which judgments were made. Listen to what Amos said was happening in the society once again. What he said was happening to the society once again in Amos chapter 5, verse 12. Amos 5, 12. Erase. For I know your many transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe. And they turn aside the poor in the gate. I'm good. Because the economic culture of the people was based on idol worship, wherein the worshippers created a religion after their own greed, there resulted all sort of economic injustices that prevailed throughout society. They became a society that was totally influenced by the bad worship of the Canaanites, with idolatry centered around gold and greed. Distinguished listeners, we must not misunderstand the idol worship of Baal as simply a religious apostasy. Idol worship was directly connected to riches. In the absence of banks, idols were made from gold and silver. An owner's unique formation of his idol was known in the community, and thus no one could steal a gold or silver idol simply because of the unique form of the idol identified its owner. So when the Old Testament speaks of idol worship, it was the worship of their riches, not simply some religious dogma that they had written and proclaimed. Paul explained this definition of idolatry in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Colossians 3, verse 5 reads, Put to death your members that are on the earth, covetousness, which is idolatry, and good. Idolatry in Israel was the converting of the riches. This was manifested in their worship, covetousness, of their gold and silver idols. In their wanton behavior and luxurious living, a Moses audience felt no remorse about the plight of the poor which the rich had created because of their greedy business dealings. The thinking of the rich became so corrupt that they had no empathy for the poor of the society or those of the farms from where the rich drew their wealth. The farmers and herdsmen simply became the indentured servants of the city rich who had the power to determine the prices of all their labors and commodities. The stimulus business. The rich of the city simply sought ways by which they could continue their exploitation of the poor farmers and herdsmen who produced all the commodities for what God originally intended should be a rural nation of farmers and herdsmen. Highly esteemlessness. Israel became an urban city that used the poor rural farmers and herdsmen for the sake of their own materialistic gratification. When a society digresses to the point where there is no consideration for those who produce the sustenance of the society, then society becomes dysfunctional. Exploitation to feed greed becomes the culture of the economy. And in the case of the northern kingdom of Israel, during the time of Jeroboam II, God judged that it was time to take this society out of existence 
because it no longer represented God among the nations. It was no longer a benevolent society that represented a benevolent God. That was unfortunate. The sinlessness. Therefore, what does Amos teach us? Amos preaches to us what? And the lesson that we want to draw is this. The message of Amos to Israel is relevant today. The sinlessness. As the world moves into a greater separation between the rich and poor, no greater message could reveal what God thinks about societies that favor the rich over the poor, to the point that the poor are exploited for the sake of the rich. The civil business. Amos' message is universal. It does not deal with one nation alone. For what was happening in Israel is often a national problem with many nations throughout the world today. In order to preach this message of God to the world, God instructed Amos to deal with all the nations, not just Israel. Though Israel majored in the sins that Amos pointed out, she was not alone in her socio-economic iniquities. The seriousness. The first lesson we can therefore draw is this. God sees sin, whatever it is. God sees sin, whatever it is. The seriousness. He thus brought judgment on the nations around Israel for their sins against humanity. Amos first asks a question that we can answer. And the question is, quote, If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? Unquote. Amos chapter 3 verse 6. Amos 3 6. With this question, Amos leads us into concluding that the calamities that are befalling the nations were the work of God. God will judge Moab to the east and Judah to the south. Amos chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. The Amorites will also suffer the judgment of God. Amos chapter 2, verse 9. Judgment was pronounced also upon Edom. Amos chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. The serious business. Though these nations eventually suffered the judgment of God, the lesson to us is that at the end of time, judgment will come on this generation of nations. For God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. Acts chapter 17 verse 31. Acts 17 31. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that everyone may receive the things done in the body. 2 Corinthians 5 10. 2 Corinthians 5 10. The same is listeners. That is a wonderful lesson number one that we're drawing from Amos as he preaches to us today. Lesson number two that we need to draw from the book of Amos is that God does not accept man-made worship. God does not accept man-made worship. The seriousness. There seems to be a striking similarity between what God condemned through Amos concerning worship and much of what the religious world today masquerades as worship. The judgment of God in Amos 5, verse 21 to 23 is direct and meaningful. For instance, assemblies for self. Assemblies for self. Listen to what God through prophet Amos told the people in Amos 5, verse 21. Amos 5, 21. He said, I hate, I despise Pice your feast days, and I will not take delight in your solemn assemblies and good. The seriousness. This is sad. How could God hate and despise feasts and assemblies that he had commanded? The answer is that the people had mingled what God had commanded them to do with the pagan Canaanite practices that surrounded them. Their gatherings had become depraved because their feasts and assemblies were directed toward the satisfaction of themselves and not an occasion to honor God. The deception of such self-gratifying assemblies was in the fact that the people fought God, but in reality there was no focus on the God of heaven. Narcissistic assemblies are not for worship of God. 
If one comes away from an assembly for worship and says that he did not get anything out of the assembly, then he is narcissistic in his worship. His worship is vain. Worship is not about what we get, but what we give. It's not about entertaining our interest. It's about pouring our house out to God. And so that is a lesson that we should also understand. That God does not accept. Why? Because we assemble for self. All these things we are mentioning are signals of God, uh, type of worship God hates. When we assemble for ourselves instead of God. Another signal of vain worship is legal offerings without remorse. Legal offerings without remorse. The sinlessness. This is what Amos told the people in Amos 5.22. Amos 5.22 he said, Though you offer me burnt offerings and your great offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Unquote. In the same nine law, the same business, they were commanded by God to make all these offerings. When you read from Leviticus chapters 2 through 7, they were commanded to make these offerings for sin. But when one persists in a work that is contrary to the word of God, he is arrogant and self-condemned. Any offerings in such a work are useless. Keeping the legalities of what is commanded profits nothing if one's heart is far removed from the command. Paul spoke of similar people when he wrote in Colossians chapter 2 verse 18. Colossians 2 18 when he said, Let no man disqualify you of your reward by delighting in false humility, false humility, and the worship of angels, intruding into those things that he has not seen, vainly puffed up, by his fleshly mind. Unquote. The same as listeners. Israel was guilty of syncretism. That is blending Canaanite bar religion with those things they were commanded to do in the Sinai law. Paul explained again in Colossians 2 verse 23. Colossians 2 23 when he said, These things have indeed a show of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and neglect of the body, but not in any value in restraining the indulgence of the flesh." Unquote. Highly esteemed listeners, doing the legal actions of what God commands, while at the same time thinking about Baal, leads one to create a self-made religion. We only deceive ourselves into believing that God would accept our offerings when we are thinking about something that is foreign to the offer he desires. There is no acceptance by God of any legal obedience to religious rites without the heart of the worshiper. But also, legal religious rites are not made right before God by the good hearts of those who walk contrary to the word of God. This is senselessness. This is food for thought. Another signal of vain worship is songs that become only noise. Songs that become only noise. Listen to what God told the people through Amos. Amos chapter 5, verse 23. Amos 5, 23, it reads, Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your strange instruments. I repeat. Amos chapter 5, verse 23. God told the people through Amos, Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your strange instruments. Unquote. The selfishness. They have created a concept of instrumental noise that appealed to them, but was empty of their hearts. They assumed that if their songs would appeal to them, then certainly they appeal to God. But in reality, what appealed to their ears was only obnoxious noise to God. Apostasy is so easy in the area of music because of the appeal of music to the human ear. We feel good about the music and that's simply because Bible words about Jesus and the God are placed here and there in the lyrics of the music. 
We assume that the music is according to the word of God. But Paul instructed in Colossians 3.16, Colossians 3.16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Unquote. The same with listeners. If one has forgotten the word of Christ, then the teaching of the song becomes vain. Because we are not teaching the word of Christ in the song. And since Israel was in a state where the people had forgotten the word of God, then they could not determine if their songs were even directed to God or bad. The only way to determine if one is singing according to the word of God is to open the word of God and study. It is so easy to develop assemblies around the noise of songs that are designed to appeal to the ears of the audience but are not for the praise of God. The same listeners, when assemblies become narcissistic, then the lyrics of the songs are only an irritating and obnoxious noise to God. We could be said of those northern kingdom of Israel at the end of their existence as a nation, what the same that Jesus said of the religious leadership of Israel during his ministry and the end of national Israel. When Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verse 6 through 8, Mark 7, 6 through 8, he said, Why did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, These people honest me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Unquote. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the traditions of men. The seriousness. This is also very serious. When we sing noise or play instruments of noise without it speaking the word of God, because how can even an instrument speak the word of God to others, then it's vain worship. Again, from the lesson of Amos, God does not honor indifference. God does not honor indifference at all. He doesn't do that. And when we say he doesn't honor indifference, what do we mean? In chapter 6, verse 1, he said, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. The text of chapter 6, 1 to 6, should awaken every idle Christian to the fact that when things seem to be economically fine for ourselves, we should be cautioned about lukewarmness setting into our Christianity. We remember the Christians in Lodicia who were in the same socioeconomic situation. The result of the social environment in which they lived was devastating to their faith. Jesus pronounced judgment upon them in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Revelation 3, 15 and 16 reads, I know your works, that you neither cold nor hot, because you are lukewarm, in neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Unquote. Prosperity often leads to indifference and lukewarmness in reference to our faith. Indifference to the needs of others often curses those who live within the cocoon of their own wealth. When such happens within a society, God says that society has lost its heart. When such happens within the fellowship of the disciples of Christ, they may have a name that they live, but they are dead. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. Amos pronounced thus, this will go captive with the first, who go captive, and those who recline at banquets will be removed. Amos chapter 6 verse 7. The same business. And what mercy would Amos have for the rich and famous who have no concern for the poor? Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are of Man Samaria, who oppress the poor, who cry the needy, who say to their husbands, Bring now that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness. Behold, the day will come on you when he will take you away with hooks and your posterity with hooks. The same with listeners. You bear me out that there are a lot of lessons we can draw from the prophets. And these were the real prophets of God. And all this message we are talking about is preaching the word of God. That's why they were called prophets. Not just foretelling the future. Major of their work was to preach. And even today when we look at the signals of false worship, we've come and understood that assembling to gratify oneself 
God hates it. Instead of God. Or obeying the legal requirement without remorse is an abomination. Songs that become only noise is an abomination. And God does not honor indifference. In addition to what we've learned, that in fact, God sees sin wherever it is. Let us learn from these prophets and let us live according to his divine dictates that he has given us. God loves us. Make a time with that God only next week as we will continue to have an inner understanding of what the dead prophets are telling us. May the good Lord be with us, whatever we are, and we meet again. Once again, this has been the Oracles of God radio broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come away every Wednesday, 5.30 a.m. Make a day with us. Same time, God willing, next week, as we continue to arrive with Christ's Oracles, you warmly invited to worship the Churches of Christ all over the country, the pillar of truth, where an the word of God is said, and God worshipped in spirit and in truth, you may want to contact us on 0245527658 or send us a message on coc.radio at yahoo.com. We're also located on Facebook at Church Radio, Church Radio. I am your brother, Eric Darko. Now may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify us through and through. May our whole body, souls, and spirit become blameless at the appearance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Till we meet again, stay richly blessed. Amen and good morning.